Hello, and welcome to Based on Facts, where fiction and superstition meet logic and scientific facts, on WELT 95.7 FM, broadcasting from the Allen County Public Library. My name is Chris Rex. On this week's episode, we're going to be covering a local festival. It happens right in the town that I grew up in, if you can call it a town. Uh, the Wolf Lake Onion Days. This is the time of year, uh, shortly before school starts, that Wolf Lake holds its annual festival celebrating onions. Now, this may strike many people as a little strange, uh, because they, they look around nowadays and they really don't see many onions uh, being grown in Indiana, so it really doesn't make any sense nowadays. But there are some legitimate reasons behind that, and we're, we're going to go into that here in a bit. But just to provide the logistical information, this year, Onion Days is taking place in Wolf Lake like it does every year, August 2nd to 5th, which is to say, Wednesday through Saturday. Now, on Saturday, uh, basically, we, we end up culminating in a big parade, um, and then we have a, some additional events that last night, and then it's done and over with. Now, just to provide some reference, there is a road right outside of Wolf Lake, uh, just on 33, for, if you're familiar with Wolf Lake and where it's at. Uh, just outside of Wolf Lake on 33 is a road that intersects it called 300 West. That is the road that I grew up on. That's where my dad currently lives. And I go out there and visit uh, frequently. The thing is that 300 West is the more technical designation for that road. The more informal word or name for that road is Onion Avenue. Now the reasoning for that is because one of my neighbors on that road uh, were the Stanglins. And the Stanglins actually were farmers based in New York. You know, they'd been out there for a number of years and one of their key crops was onions. But they decided to trade off their land uh, for some land in Indiana and move out to the Midwest. So they actually ended up acquiring 600 acres of land in Indiana. They're like, all right, cool, well, let's go out there and check it out because they had never been to Indiana before. You know, they come here, they find that it's a great place to grow onions, and so they basically have, you know, uh, a huge onion farm by that point, and most of it was based around 300 West, or what later came to be known as Onion Avenue. Now, like I said, it's a little strange when you go to 300 West nowadays because you won't find any onions being grown there, save in the tiny little garden plots that some of the uh, people who live on that road decide to grow. You know, definitely not on an industrial scale uh, that's appreciable in any way, shape, or form. But anyway, kind of neat. What ended up happening was this kind of became a worldwide phenomenon, all right? which is a little strange to think about. But one of the things helping it was the fact that Wolf Lake is actually the oldest town in Noble County. And that might have something to do with the fact that it's on US 33, uh, which, you know, some people consider to be... Uh, uh, part of the Lincoln Highway, um, but Wolf Lake is great because it's also a juncture between 33 and another road, State Road 109, okay, which ends up leading to Columbia City. So it was actually kind of an important little hub between those two roads. Now granted, we were talking about back in the day, uh, a couple hundred years ago, it really was, you know, just a mere stop along the route to get to wherever you were going. So if we think about the history of Onion Days itself in Wolf Lake, well, we're really thinking about the beginning of the festival in 1906. All right, uh, These Stanglins had been around town. They'd made a name for themselves by basically becoming the uh, world capital of onion farmers, and 
So Wolf Lake kind of took that and manipulated it into a yearly festival to celebrate one of the great things about that area. Now, with this Onion Festival, they start celebrating it in 1906, but then for some reason, I'm not entirely sure about this, for some reason in 1918, they stopped. That was the last year that it was celebrated. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. Uh, I'd have to look it up a little bit more. But what was bizarre was that, I don't know, about uh, uh, 54 years later, we end up rediscovering this Onion Days Festival and re-celebrating it. So in 1972, the celebrations picked up again, and people started celebrating, celebrating it every year, which makes this, this year's festival, the 45th celebration of Onion Days. Yeah, part two. <laughs> the second half of the uh, Onion Days festivals. Now, if we think about how it was originally started, you know, back in 1906, it really started off being a, a single block worth of a party. All right. So we would have some people come in, offer some goods, some vendors, uh, maybe have some games and prizes. But really, it was just a one-day thing, and boom, we're done. Well, now, nowadays... You know, you have it being a four-day long festival, Wednesday through Saturday. You have it involving a uh, big parade on the last day. You know, you have all these other things that have kind of been tossed in there and really made to stretch it out and have a multiple-day party, so to speak. Now, the interesting thing is that, like I said, nowadays you really won't find much onions grown in Indiana. And in fact, if you go to uh, the Onions USA website, you will find that Indiana is not even listed by itself. It's actually included in the other category as far as onion production, lumped in with several other states um, in the U.S. So it, it doesn't even have its own category. It produces so few onions on a commercial scale. So kind of bizarre. We started pretty well. <laughs> Started off on a great note, being the onion capital of the world in Wolf Lake, and um, nowadays, nothing. <laughs> kind of bizarre. Anyway, if we go back to thinking about what this festival consists of, at least nowadays, we can actually think about a number of onion-related activities, obviously. You know, things like an, uh, an onion art show, uh, things like onion judging, uh, as far as what that consists of, I'm sure there are multiple different metrics <laughs> uh, from appearance to scent and so on. Uh, we can also see some normal types of fair type of prizes and games and things going on, you know, including a, a pizza eating contest. You know, you'll have a, a kitty king and queen pageant, a Mr. and Miss Onion Days pageant. You'll have a pet show, you'll have a pedal pull, basketball tournament, cornhole tournament, a karaoke, a car show, a tractor show, a 5K run, which is actually relatively new, um, a garden tractor pull. If you're not familiar with garden tractors, they are basically riding lawnmowers that we're talking about. Pie judging, uh, tug of war, incognito cloggers are going to be there performing their um, uh, performing their show, trivia contest, silent auction, and a number of live bands. Uh, there's basically a live band every night. Okay, Nick said, I think there's one night to where there's no live bands. But the Auburn Dixielanders will be there this year. Uh, the Nashville Rebels, the Honey Badgers, and Reckon will all be playing on different uh, nights throughout the festival. Now, just considering where I fit into the mix, you know, I said that I grew up on Onion Avenue. I actually ended up going to Wolf Lake Elementary uh, when I was growing up. So I was used to going to Onion Days every year, right? And you know, I have a lot of a lot of fond memories there. Um, it's just that when you consider what Onion Days is, you're talking about a festival for a town that consists of a bank 
a uh, quick little one-stop fast food restaurant kind of thing. Uh, that's a, a drive-in, basically. That's only open for part of the year. You're talking about one gas station. Talking about the school, of course. Talking about the uh, post office and the firefighter um, uh, building. And then you're talking about a bar. I mean, that's that really pretty much sums up what Wolf Lake is. It's not a whole lot. Okay, there, there's not even a stoplight in town. All right, it's literally just a uh, a glimpse of a moment as you're driving along 33 to go to other places like Fort Wayne or uh, Goshen or whatever. So, yeah, not not uh, not the most important or large. Um, a tourist attraction in the area, so to speak. But, you know, like I said, it was nice growing up to have this this local type festival that I could just go to, uh, hang out at, you know, see some of my classmates, uh, maybe stir up some trouble. And honestly, it was kind of neat just from my perspective because it gave me an opportunity to get more involved with the community with one of the organizations I was a part of as I was growing up, the Boy Scouts. You know, they normally have a booth there set up. They normally have a, a tank that they bring in. And it's one of those games where you have a like a baseball or something, a softball or something, and you're throwing it at a target. If you hit the target, which is a very small target, uh, if you hit the target, you engage a lever, which basically dunks a person into a tank of water. I was able to participate in that, help with that activity as I was growing up, um, either being you know, one of the helpers outside of the tank or being inside the tank myself. So it was definitely a neat experience growing up to have that, but I would not really see myself doing something like that again. Now, additionally, uh, when we think about some of the events that go on during Onion Days, you know, they have a number of different vendors, offer a variety of different wares, uh, including toys, jewelry, you know, various knickknacks. Of course, you can find all sorts of typical fair food, you know, burgers, hot dogs, uh, pork tenderloins, elephant ears, things of that nature. I mean, you can, you can find all the typical fair stuff at Onion Days. Uh, now, as far as rides and such... Generally, that's pretty limited, just because the size of this festival is very, very small. Uh, you know, so they've had some very, very small things in the past, but I think they've pretty much done away with, you know, typical carnival types of rides. Uh, the other thing to consider is that I was also able to, when I was growing up, take part in the parade, which was kind of nice. Um, you know, handing out candy, showing off, riding in the back of an ambulance. Uh, or a fire truck or something, because my parents were both EMTs and firefighters. So it was kind of neat being able to, you know, show off by walking in the parade and uh, handing out candy to the kids or whatever. It was actually pretty cool. Additionally, you know, being part of the Boy Scouts, sometimes I would march with them in the parade. Uh, so I always had a reason to be out there and in involved with the Wolf Lake community during Onion Days. Nowadays, unfortunately, I don't really find myself associated with anything directly in Wolf Lake. And that's most notably because I live in Fort Wayne. You know, I have my own career that has nothing to do with anything in Fort Wa in uh, Wolf Lake. You know, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm a professor, I'm a tutor, and all of those businesses are run through Fort Wayne. So I really don't have any ties to Wolf Lake anymore. But lately, I've been wanting to get involved again. You know, I kind of, kind of miss being a part of it. I kind of feel like there are some ways that I can help, some things that I am relatively good at, or at least some ways that I can contribute to making Onion Days better. You know, uh, good phrase that everybody loves to throw around nowadays is uh, making something great again. Well, I would love. To help make Onion Days great again. And I really feel like there are some opportunities that 
Onion Days can expand its presence uh, in the social media kind of living uh, that we're, you know, basically uh, social media kind of environment that we're living in right now. You know, everything is about social media. Everything is about digital forms of communication. Everything is about having a good uh, website and Facebook and Twitter and whatever. And all those things can be easily and quickly managed by one person or by tiny contributions from a lot of people. And I know this because as vice president of Free Thought Fort Wayne, I realize how much a lot of this stuff takes to set up. But then once it's set up, man, it's so easy to use. It just takes mere seconds, you know, to type something out and then share it instantaneously to both Twitter and to Facebook. Just boom, and it's done. And it's done. Yeah, we don't even have to worry about anything else in the world. Just boom, and it's done. So that's kind of cool. I really like that. I like being able to integrate things from different sources. Of course, with a website, you can integrate even more things to where you integrate literally every single source that you have. You know, whether you have a, you know, Facebook, a YouTube, a Twitter, uh, all these different things can all be integrated into the website in some way, shape, or form. And that's awesome. Being able to do that is just such an incredible power. And I feel like it's a power that's really untapped when it comes to a lot of these local types of festivals or uh, gatherings or yearly events or whatever. I really don't feel like they're being utilized as much as they could. And so not just to pick on Onion Days, but to pick on a number of different local festivals and things. They really aren't doing the best job at getting the word out there and getting something that looks professional, that is professional, that's devoid of typos, uh, that looks like it was designed by somebody who cares about uh, graphic design, who cares about posting high quality images and schedules that make sense, that are easy to read, and that people can just sit there and reference print out, whatever. That way they don't have to go to, you know, a gas station and pick up a handout for a brochure on the event. We should be past that in this day and age. We should be past the point where you need something in hand, a physical copy, and that there is no way to look it up online that's very adequate. Okay? We need to be past that. And I feel like that is one way that I can contribute nowadays two festivals like Onion Days um, or Chain of Lakes Festival or Turtle Days or whatever, all those local festivals around town that I used to go to as a kid, you know, in Cherubusco and in Albion, all those festivals, I feel like they can be doing a much better job. And just because somebody doesn't necessarily have a degree in social media or communication or whatever, you really don't need that to do these jobs. You just need to have some degree of knowledge of technology, of graphic design, of professionalism. You know, being able to just present things in the public space that are able to be respected and kind of admired. You know, I mean, I just feel like so much stuff is just kind of wishy-washy nowadays, just randomly thrown together nowadays. There's not a whole lot of oversight, not a whole lot of um, double checking, not a whole lot of editing. I, I just, I don't feel like there's enough effort being put forth towards uh, maintaining or even achieving a professional kind of environment. And so you end up having these festivals and things that are just kind of randomly thrown together. And yeah, they have a schedule. That's great. However... <laughs> Getting that schedule out there is kind of important. And getting it out there in a meaningful, in a professional way, is really kind of paramount. Not to mention, with a number of these festivals, they don't, they, they aren't normally the best at keeping track of and logging the previous festivals. You know, honestly, with a website nowadays, with a website, you can set up an entire gallery on your website for each year that you hold this yearly festival 
and it can just sit there. You know, from now until the end of time, and log every single one of those festivals. And that's that's great. You know, anybody can come in, see what the activities were for any of the previous years, see uh, who the winners were for all the contests. They can come in and see pictures and videos from all the previous activities of all the previous years. That's power. That's awesome. That's how you continue driving people to come to these things because they're like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. You captured that on footage or you you captured that on a picture. That's so cool. You know, and, and just from a uh, visitor to these fest to these festivals perspective, it's nice to be able to go on to these websites and things and be like, hey, that's me in that picture. That's me winning that contest. You know, there's finally evidence. That's that's awesome to know that there's evidence. Awesome to know that somebody cared enough to take a picture and that somebody cared enough to take a picture and then post it to Facebook, to a website, whatever. That's really kind of what a lot of these festivals need right now in terms of help. Otherwise, they risk dying out or fizzling away, and I really don't want to see that. You know, I don't want to see Onion Days disappear again like it did in 1918. I want to see it come back every single year. I want to see it get uh, better. I want to see it uh, maintain the things that it's already done great at. But it would be nice to see that kind of incremental improvement every year. And that's really what I would like to help contribute and work towards as far as Wolf Lake Onion Days. Just to take a step back from the festival, because I, I think I've mentioned the festival enough. Um, the, the only other thing I guess I would mention is back when I was growing up and that we had horses, uh, at another time I was also in the parade um, uh, riding horses, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and uh, and my parents were as well. Uh, other than that, I think I've mentioned everything else with regards to the Onion Days Festival. Going on to more about the onion itself, because that's it's really important to understand why people cared so much about onions. You know, back in 1906, cared so much about onions that they wanted to make a festival out of it. Now, obviously, there was having the the moniker of uh, world capital in onion production. But, the question is why? Why grow so many onions? Like, people sit here and they think, well, that's not quite as edible or useful as soybeans or corn. Why in the world would you worry so much about growing onions? Well, we'll get to that. First off, we have to understand what an onion is. Okay, And when we think about the kinds of onions that we grow, more often than not, it's it's a variety called the common onion. Imagine that, right? Most common type of onion is called common onion. The scientific name for this onion is Allium sepa. Right? And this thing is distributed worldwide. And that's why it's the common onion, because it's everywhere. It's pretty common, so to speak. But if we think about other species within that same genus, Allium, you realize that, well, onion is pretty close in form and function to a number of other types of plants. Okay, things like garlic, for instance, uh, shallots, leeks, chives, all these different types of plants share some level of relatedness to onions. You know, even just directly comparing an onion bulb to a garlic bulb, they're like, huh, there are some superficial differences. Now, obviously, onions don't break off into cloves, but there are definitely certain other superficial similarities there. It's kind of interesting. Hmm. Excuse me. The other thing to keep in mind is that when we're thinking about the common onion, the common onion, Allium sepa, is not something that you can find in the wild. All right. That's not what we're talking about at all. In fact, it is domesticated 
from the onion Allium vavi, vavilovi, sorry, uh, in Iran, about 5,000 years ago or so. Uh, four to 5,000 years, that's a little contentious. So there was this type of onion that's endangered in Iran that actually is the closest living relative to the common onion that we have today. Now, unfortunately, by saying closest living relative, I'm kind of hinting at the fact that we really don't have the relative, <laughs> the missing link, so to speak, between the common onion and uh, the onion in Iran. Okay. Now, keep in mind, because of what I just said, that the onion in Iran is endangered, it is entirely possible that the missing link between uh, the Valvi Lovi, Valvi Lovi onion, um, missing link between that and the Sepa onion may be extinct. We may have already wiped it out. So it may no longer be able to be found in the wild, and we may never find out what the exact genes or uh, phenotypes are of that particular onion, which is unfortunate. One of the things that's great about humans is that we are good at colonizing and pillaging all natural resources, uh, including native species of onions and other plants of that nature. Uh, through over-harvesting, through habitat destruction, it's just how it works sometimes. And it's really unfortunate. If you think about the chromosome structure of the common onion, you actually come to conclude that it hasn't undergone anything fancy at all. Uh, the common onion actually has not duplicated its chromosomes from its original onion, or even the uh, most closely related one, the valvioli. Um, that actually has maintained the same ploidy, so to speak, the same number of chromosomes, uh, which actually I forgot to look up how many chromosomes those are. Um, but in plants, it's really funny, because if you think about plants and how they evolve, they often like to duplicate their chromosomes. Okay, So if we're talking about 60 pairs of chromosomes in uh, valvioli, that's, that's actually something that... Uh, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Vavilovi. Uh, I keep mispronouncing that word because it's really hard to pronounce. Uh, the Vavilovi, if there were 60 chromosomes in that, there are 60 chromosomes in the SEPA. Like I said, I, I didn't look up those actual numbers, but it's important to note that they're the same number of chromosomes. Okay, and that there was not a chromosome duplication event or a ploidy, ploidy event uh, that happened in the process of domesticating the common onion from uh, the Vavilovi uh, onion. So it, it's very important to note that. Also, it's kind of important to see how many different kinds of onions there are in the world. All right, so I'm just going to list off a few of them here for you because I, I really didn't have a clue how many different types uh, or variants or species of onions there were in the world. You know, all these are allium species but they're not all sepa, okay? So there are some definite differences between some of these. Just to list them off for you, we have the Altai, the Pearl, the Canada, the Everready, the Potato, the Multiplier, the Bunching, the Welsh, the Oblique, Wakigi, the Top, the Tree, the Egyptian, which we'll get to here in a sec, Catawissa, and the long root onion. Okay, those are all different types of onions, all with certain properties that are distinct to that particular species or geographic variant. Now, keep in mind, not all of these came from Vavilovi. Um, some of them did come from other strains and other varieties uh, of wild onions, but also keep in mind that we're not necessarily implicating uh, that all of these are 
natural or unnatural, so to speak. Okay. So some of them are definitely direct strains from the wild. Others are domesticated to some degree, which is to say that humans, through the process of artificial selection, have bred these plants to favor certain characteristics, whether it's the bulb size, uh, bulb type, uh, the uh, smell of the onion, um, the color of the onion, whatever. Okay, all these different characteristics may be selected for or against in the process of artificial selection, which is to say humans breeding something with an end goal in mind. That's the process of domestication of crops. That's what's happened with most of our crops that we currently use in the world. So when somebody comes up to you and offers you an all-natural onion, keep in mind that that's really hard to come by. It's really hard to come across an onion that is completely untouched by man. Which is to say, it's hard to come across a strain of onion that has not had its genetics modified at one point or another through selective breeding by people. Therefore, most of the crops that we enjoy today are not natural at all because we have selected them for different traits. They are GMOs. Most of our crops are GMOs. Okay, I'm not talking about made in a lab. I'm talking about genetically modified through artificial selection. Those are GMOs. It's just that artificial selection is a shotgun approach. It's not very precise, which is why we have advanced the technology and gotten to the point where we can directly go in and edit genes very, very specifically in our, quote, GMO crops in order to produce crops with exactly those characteristics instead of trying to willy-nilly artificially select for various traits realizing that any time that you try to breed multiple things together you are crossing a number of different traits which is to say it's a shotgun approach because you are changing many different genes and the gene frequencies along the way whereas GMOs you can go in and specifically edit one gene and you're done. And that's it. Nothing else was impacted. That's why it just, it blows my mind as to why there's so much hatred and fear and misunderstanding when it comes to GMOs. Because GMOs are so much safer. They are so much better than anything else we possibly have. Because when we are trying to make a better plant, being able to go in and modify just one gene produces wildly different results in a positive way that helps us achieve our goals, being able to feed everyone and feed them food that is nutritious. Right? That really helps those goals. Going back to onions though, if you think about all these different types of onions, you start realizing that, well, onions are actually really important. They serve a lot of different purposes. I mean, yeah, garlic kind of does. Uh, uh, leeks kind of do. Chives kind of do. But really, onions are the big money. And so if you think about it, they really are the most economical uh, allium type of crop to grow. All right. Of all the different species, all the different species of allium that are out there in the world today, the most uh, economically beneficial crop is the onion. Right. And most notably, it's the common onion. You know, the allium sepa that I was talking about. So it's very important to keep that in mind that when we're talking about onions, we're really trying to narrow our focus to the common onion because of how important it is. Now, just as an aside, it makes you wonder, why is onion so popular? Why is it so prevalent? And why is it worldwide? Like, that's just, that's crazy to me because I, generally speaking, hate onions. I mean, I'm just, I'm not a big fan of onions at all. I would, 
I would never ingest a raw onion. If it's grilled enough, I can handle it. You know, to where it's basically a brown or black thread of material. I can handle eating that. Obviously, onion rings. I, I don't know who could say no to an onion ring. I mean, come on. That's, that's an awesome uh, piece of breaded wonderfulness that's just going to clog your arteries and kill you later. How could you, you know, turn that down? Uh, it's just kind of amazing. Um, but really, I really don't see any other utility for onions. I mean, you know, just having my wife slice them up for her burger or whatever, I mean, my my eyes just start welling up with water and I just get this huge burning sensation like they're on fire. I just, I can't, I can't take it can't take the flavor, I can't take the smell, uh, I can't take the fumes that attack my eyeballs. I just, onion is kind of a disgusting, toxic plant to me. Uh, it's just, I don't know, always kind of boggles my mind as, as far as how this can be such a huge thing that would warrant 600 acres of crops just for onion. That just doesn't make any sense to me. And then... I started looking into it and found that, well, historically, onion has had a lot of different purposes to it. All right. We see that onion is very easy to cultivate, very easy to make into a garden, um, very easy to grow in a garden uh, in a number of different climate conditions. Um, it is um, very good as a food item for staying fresh for long periods of time. Uh, obviously you can also dry it out, desiccate it, uh, and make it fresher for longer, so to speak. Um, you know, it's, it's great at being preserved types of food. Um, it also is a great item for transporting to other areas. Um, whether we're talking about the opposite side of the country or other countries altogether, it's great at being transportable because of the fact that it stays fresh and it can be made uh, and it can be preserved very very well. The other things to consider is that it has a number of other uses that have nothing to do with food, right? So we have things like onions being used in religion right? or art or medicine or even mummification which is really bizarre to think about. And so when we step back and start thinking about all these different uses, you notice that onions have been used, have been utilized in a number of different cultures all around the world. Now, I said that the original strain, or at least a close living relative of the strain, uh, came from Iran. And that actually kind of fits as being uh, one of the hubs for all these different cultures in that area that utilized onions. Okay. So we can think about the Egyptians. You know, I mentioned mummification that immediately brings images of Egyptians. And so you're sitting here wondering, well, what the heck did they have to do with onions? That doesn't make any sense to me. And it's like, well, if you look at some of the hieroglyphs, you will notice onions being associated with burial practices. Okay with some of the priests uh, handling them and putting them next to uh, some of the burial rites and such. Um, you'll also notice that onions were actually buried with a number of pharaohs. Okay? And that kind of is tied into the anatomy of an onion. Right? The fact that when Egyptians looked at an onion, they saw this ring inside of a ring, inside of a ring, inside of a ring. You know, this, this kind of shell structure um, we have multiple different shells of, uh, of flesh, so to speak, in this onion. That really kind of symbolized to the Egyptians, well, that's, that's something that, you know, it's got to be indicative of eternity or eternal life or something like that because these rings just go on and on and on. It's just really kind of crazy. And if we look at a specific example in Egypt, in Egypt, uh, we actually see that King Ramses IV was mummified with onions in his eye sockets. Which is even more bizarre. It's like, oh my gosh, in the eye sockets? Like, having it down by your waist or your pelvis or whatever, 
that's one thing. Okay, that, that was seen in a number of different uh, tombs and such that the onions were placed there. But in King Ramsay's case, they were placed in the eyes. You know, almost like he wanted to uh, be able to see for all eternity or something like that. Uh, or see into the eternal abyss. Um, just something like that. To try to confer some sort of magical power or protection uh, for that particular person in the afterlife. If we think about some of these other properties of onions, you know, I mentioned medicine here for a moment. Well, the Egyptians knew that too. And so maybe putting in the eye sockets was also kind of tied into, well, maybe some of the antiseptic properties of onions. Okay, so maybe uh, can help go through his system in the afterlife and keep him cleansed of wounds. Uh, keep his wounds cleansed, so to speak, when he incurs wounds during fights uh, in the afterlife or something. Um, you know, maybe maybe the strong scent uh, can help give him magical powers. You know, the fact that just cutting open an onion makes you tear up uh, within a few short seconds. You know, that, that seemed kind of magical to the Egyptians. And so maybe having onions in the eye sockets gave him some other power associated with some sort of super ability uh, in the afterlife. So very, very interesting, some of the ideas that Egyptians had uh, for using onions. Of course, there were other cultures that had a use for onions. One of those cultures, the Indians, they actually ended up using onions uh, more along the medicinal route. So for things such as Helping with an upset stomach, you know, helping uh, aid digestion. Um, things like uh, if you need to have a diuretic, uh, which is to say if you need to encourage urination, well, you can certainly, uh, you can certainly eat an onion and have that happen. So use it for that particular um, purpose there. Uh, if you needed to uh, have some sort of medicinal help with your heart, your eyes, your joints, um, if any of those were off and you felt like you needed to heal or help mend any of those parts, well then you would be um, prescribed to take uh, onions in one form or another. So, kind of interesting there that the onions uh, were really used as a good medicinal tool in India. The Greeks also used onions. Uh, in particular, they, they tried to use them as a staple to help out their athletes in the Olympic Games. All right, you know, we always talk about the Olympics uh, every couple years here as being a great way to bring a number of different cultures together and compete in sports, um, have some sort of unifying factor even though a number of the countries uh, are at war with them one another or not on the best terms with one another. We can at least still agree to come together on sports and uh, enjoy the games. Well, the Greeks actually used onions as a staple support system for their athletes to where athletes would load up on onions in their diet uh, shortly before the games. You know, They would drink onion juice. Uh, they would even go so far as to rub onion all over their body right before competing. I mean, it's just, wow, things like that just kind of amaze me because, once again, you know, all I can think of is the burning sensation in my eyeballs anytime I imagine cut-up onion being involved in anything, much less rubbing that oil all over myself and just coming out onto, um, you know, uh, an Olympic game and just, like, crying just down my face. Uh, tears everywhere because I have this onion all over me and my eyes are burning like they have mace, you know. It's just, it's really quite incredible to try to imagine that. The other thing is we can think of closely related culture to the Greeks, the Romans. And now they kind of carried on some of this onion love uh, later on down the line. Most notably, we can think of one of the most famous cities in Roman culture, Pompeii. 
Now, Pompeii, if you're not familiar with that name, this was a Roman city uh, that basically suffered at the hand of Mount Vesuvius, which was a volcano that erupts every some odd years, and unfortunately it erupted at the height of the city Pompeii. Uh, the city had 11,000 residents living there and was flourishing. And one of their biggest crops that they grew there was onions. It's kind of amazing to think about that. But at the time of Mount Vesuvius eruption, of the Mount Vesuvius eruption, they had a number of different onion plots scattered throughout the city. And obviously once the uh, volcano erupted, basically the entire city was encased in a 16-foot layer of ash. Uh, now that was um, basically after <laughs> and or during the 100 mile per hour wave of uh, hot ash that steamrolled down the mountain uh, shortly after eruption. Uh, and, that's, and that's really what ended up killing uh, 2,000 people in that city uh, almost instantaneously as this, this, this hot wave of smoke and ash um, was 1300 degrees. Uh, it's, it's really quite incredible imagining a heat wave that's that extreme. But what was really cool was that the ash that followed, it basically encased the city in this huge layer of ash. And honestly, the, the city was kind of lost for a while just because of the effect of this volcano. Um, it really kind of hid the city for a long time, you know, almost 2,000 years. And once we found it again, we noticed how perfectly preserved a number of different things were. Um, you know, you basically ended up having uh, fossilized artifacts, um, people, uh, animals, plants, everything was just kind of fossilized or mummified by this layer of ash because it literally coated everything in, you know, a period of 24 hours after the eruption. Just thinking about that is really quite incredible. And imagining what was going through those people's minds as that volcano erupted is, is really quite a remarkable thing. I mean, especially once you start digging around in the ash and finding people lying in all these different types of positions um, with their family members, uh, with their dog, etc. It, it really goes a long way to say something about... Um, the state of humanity when you see people perfectly preserved in the position that they were when they died. Uh, it's really quite incredible and it's always been one of the most fascinating aspects of study for me as a scientist just being able to capture something so raw and so gritty. But one of the other things that we were able to preserve in the ash was evidence of all the onions. Uh, all the onions that they were eating and that they were growing uh, all these garden plots in town that were devoted to growing onions, we were able to see all that in perfect preservation. It's really quite incredible. Um, uh, quite an incredible event and really helped us understand the place the onions had in Roman history. Now, going to the Americas, uh, you know, where we kind of are, uh, we can think about the pilgrims who originally settled the Americas, uh, well, yeah, predominantly uh, the original settlers, and on the Mayflower, you know, very famous ship that the pilgrims came over with, uh, they did have a number of onions, because they were planning on cultivating onion crops upon reaching the New World. Of course, they didn't necessarily know or realize that Native Americans had already kind of uh, done that. <laughs> now granted it, it wasn't the same strain, right, um, of onion so to speak, but the Native Americans were already cultivating onions. Okay, So many different cultures independently 
all over the world were growing onions in fields, in crops, and were artificially selecting for different characteristics. All of them separate from each other. Wasn't this worldwide conspiracy? It's just the fact that onion was a very, uh, very common plant in many parts of the world, and that ancient cultures, a number of them found a use for it, and found utility in growing it as a crop and domesticating it. And Native Americans were not an exception. You know, they they definitely found utility in the onion, and they took advantage of it. Now, so so as I just found it to be kind of ironic, you know, the pilgrims come over with uh, <laughs> a bunch of onions to, to plant in the ground and grow, and then they realize, oh, well, you guys already have onions. Huh. Well, let's compare onions, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, goodness. So, anyway, I just kind of wanted to do an episode on onions uh, just to kind of help explain onion days for Wolf Lake here. You know, I, I would definitely like to see uh, a lot of this information kind of presented and um, uh, assembled into a single place, whether that be on a well-designed uh, website or Facebook page or something, just something, to permanently hold this information and put this information out there for the public and get people interested in onions. Because honestly, as much as I hate eating onions... They are really fascinating little things, little plants, you know. They have an interesting history that's rich in diversity and uh, cultural differences. It's just, it's incredible learning all this, um, you know, in this process of researching this topic. So I'm really quite impressed. I really enjoyed learning about onions. I hope you did too. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Based on Facts. If you're interested in finding any of our ep other episodes, you can certainly look us up on Facebook or on YouTube just by typing Based on Facts into the search bar. Thank you so much for joining me this week, and have a great one.